My name is uh, Dr. Travis Morris, and I have the honor and distinct privilege of being the Peace and War Center uh, Director, and it is my privilege also to welcome you to tonight's Todd Lecture Series. Tonight we're going to have an engaging conversation and a continuation from the panel that we know that you'll be thrilled about. It's also my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our Provost and Dean of the Faculty, Dr. Sandra Affinito. Let's give a round of applause. I know we have uh, many guests in the room, and if you would afford me, ma'am, just to uh, read a bit of your bio to share with everyone. So in this capacity, she provides leadership in program and curriculum development, which covers assessment, accreditation, strategic and financial planning, community partnerships, development, maintenance, and growth of the university's program infrastructure and capacity, which translates she has a, a tremendous leadership role and responsibility here at our institution. So throughout her career, she has had an active academic agenda as a teacher, as a scholar, as a biobehavioral research scientist. She holds a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Connecticut, and she completed postdoctoral training in biomedical and behavioral sciences at Wesleyan University through the National Institute of Health. She has written and co-authored 60 peer-reviewed journal publications and has been invited as a speaker at multiple international and national conferences relating to pedi pediatric obesity, diabetes, women's health, eating behaviors, and nutrition intake. Collectively, she has over 35 years of leadership and administrative experience in higher education, in healthcare, in the corporate sector, and all of these experiences in her leadership background provides her the ability to lead in a complex environment with students and faculty and staff from the US and international institutions in a very effective and efficient way. It's our pleasure, let's welcome Dr. Afanito. Thank you, Dr. Morris. I got up quickly so that um, you would say less, but it really is all about um, our speaker this evening, and it's a distinct honor and privilege to be here tonight to introduce our keynote. So welcome. Welcome, everyone, to Norwich University and the Todd Lecture Series. Tonight's keynote culminates the two-day Norwich University Military Writers Symposium that has addressed the provocative theme Warfare in the 21st Century, Future Battlegrounds. For the past 48 hours, our active and inquisitive learning community has engaged this topic in classrooms, through writing, intensive workshops, in panel discussion, and through interdisciplinary conversations. I would like to thank the guests of the symposium who has spent the past two days with our students, faculty, and our staff. Paul Scher. <laughs> Benedetta Birdie. <laughs> Ian Brown, who is with us. <laughs> David Bellavia. <laughs> I would also like to warmly welcome this evening Dr. Robin Havers. President and CEO of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago, whose support, enduring support for the Military Writers Symposium and the Colby Award makes this amazing academic experience all possible. Additional thanks are due to the members of the Todd Lecture Series Committee, as well as to the members of the Todd and Drew families joining us via the live stream this evening. The Todd Lecture Series is named in honor of retired U.S. Army Major General and Norwich President Emeritus W. Russell Todd and his late wife, Carol. We are so grateful for their dedicated service to and support of Norwich University and the Northfield community. I would like to also recognize the Todd's daughter and son-in-law, Ellen, and John Drew, as well as all of the Drew Foundation members, 
for their generous donation here for resources for the specific purpose of funding our Todd lecture series. The lecture series will always be free. It will always be open to the greater Vermont community and to the Norwich student body and stream live to Norwich students and alumni across the globe. It is now my distinct honor and true privilege to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Peter Warren Singer. Dr. Singer is strategist and senior fellow at the New America Foundation, the author of multiple award-winning books and a professor of practice at Arizona State University. He has been named by the Smithsonian as one of the nation's 100 leading innovators by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people in defense issues and by foreign policy to their top 100 global thinkers and as an official mad scientist for the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command. So that's 300 plus um, in total. Analytica Social Media Data Analysis has named Dr. Singer as one of the 10 most influential voices in the world of cybersecurity and the 25th most influential voice in the field of robotics. Described by the Wall Street Journal as the premier futurist in the national security environment, Dr. Singer is considered one of the world's leading experts on changes in 21st century warfare. He's consulted for the US military, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the FBI. And he has advised a range of entertainment programs for Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, Universal, HBO, Discovery, History Channel, and the video game called, series called Call to Duty. Dr. Singer served as coordinator of the Obama campaign's Defense Policy Task Force and was named to the U.S. Military's Transformation Advisory Group. He is an associate with the U.S. Air Force China Aerospace Studies Institute. Additionally, Dr. Singer has served as a member of the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Communications and Information Policy and as an advisor to IDS. Dr. Singer's award-winning books include the following, Corporate Warriors, the rise of the private changed your personal lives, uh, how we communicate with our family, uh, how we don't communicate with our family. Uh, those of you in the room uh, that have kids or those of you that are kids have had the um, situation of sitting at the table and everyone staring down at the screen. Um, it's changed education uh, from how we're connecting with people that aren't here right now to creating entire new departments for cybersecurity and of course has changed warfare. Now, along the way, though, there's been a couple other changes that have happened that are important. The first one of these is in the hardware side. All of those computers that were lashed together into that original intergalactic computer network lacked what's known as a sensor. They lacked the ability to gather information about the world beyond the computer. Whether you're talking about on the left there, that's the uh, original server for ARPANET. It's about the size of a refrigerator. To the one that, um, that young man there, anyone recognize him? It's Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, almost exactly uh, 15 and a half years back, he's sitting in his dorm room programming what was originally called Face Mash then called the Facebook, and then Facebook. All of them lacked the ability to gather information about the world beyond the computer. Now, pretty much every computer has uh, over 25 sensors on it. Some are pretty obvious. The camera, taking imagery of the world beyond the computer. Uh, other ones lie in the background, um, geolocation. Where in the world is this computer? Therefore, where in the world is the user of this computer? Our uh, friends in the room who know cybersecurity will also know there's a thing called metadata that's sort of uh, sensor data put on top of the messages themselves. There's a second change, though, that's exemplified by the story of young Mark Zuckerberg there. It's um, not just the ability to gather information, but to share it in fundamentally new ways. And um, this is sometimes known as uh, Internet 2.0, uh, Web 2.0, or more popularly, social media. And essentially what happened is it brought together two types of historic communication revolutions.
So if we look back in the history of communication, new technologies would come along and they would change either one of two things. Either they brought two people together in a fundamentally new and better way, the telegraph, the telephone. Or they allowed one person to reach many in a new, better way, the printing press, radio, TV, broadcasting now. What social media allowed you to do is combine those two together. You could simultaneously do one-on-one -on -one interaction, but also broadcast out to the world, all in real time. And that's not just the communication revolution. That's the very appeal of it. And there's a fascinating um, quote that's been said uh, by three wildly different people. One is Donald Trump, a businessman turned celebrity, turned commander in chief. The other is LeBron James, a uh, teenager turned basketball player, turned celebrity, turned businessman. And the third is a young man, uh, Janaid Hussein, who was a teenager turned terrorist turn celebrity. Three wildly different people and they all said that the reason they like and use social media is it's like owning your own newspaper. And unpack what they mean by that, owning your own newspaper. You get to decide what news to collect, you get to decide how to package it and what then to share with your audience. Now that leads to something else, something that we call like war. The first is the experience of all of this. The internet may have begun as a way to connect and communicate, first among Pentagon-supported scientists, then nerds, then the rest of us. So it was a communication space. Then it became a marketplace, billions and even trillions of dollars. But as you started to put people and they then bring in their interactions, news, politics, it's begun to feel a little bit like a war zone. And we all notice that every time there's some event, be it a very clear and obvious political event, a battle, an election, an impeachment, or an event in um, a rollout of a, a certain product, a new movie, a new music album, to just what happened at a party last weekend we end up seeing battles back and forth, people taking sides, battling over everything from what you should believe to what you should do to what's the nature of the truth itself. And we all kind of feel those battles happening as they play out on our Twitter feeds, Facebook, Instagram. But there's something else. It hasn't just begun to sort of feel like a war zone. Our research team spent about five years tracking how people were using social media. Initially, we focused on in traditional war zones, so places like Iraq and Ukraine. But very quickly, we saw it had to morph into other areas. Uh, so if you are looking in Iraq at um, ISIS's use of it, there was battlefield use. But very quickly, the key issue was also how they were um, motivating and coordinating terrorism outside of Iraq and Syria. Uh, if you're looking at terrorism, you start to look at other locales, maybe, for example, looking in uh, Mexico, drug war. Well, now we've moved into criminality. If we're looking at criminality, we also have to look at, for example, not just how cartels are using it, but how street gangs in uh, Los Angeles and Chicago go back to Ukraine. If we're looking at Russian military use of social media, it's targeting the Ukrainian military. It's also targeting Ukrainian politics and elections. Hmm, starting to see the same things reaching into Poland, Hungary, Brexit, the United States. Some of the things that they're doing in these spaces, whether it's politics or terrorism, is not just copycatting what celebrities are doing, but they're moving into it. So we looked at how celebrities are doing it. Or it's just things that teenagers are doing naturally, whether they are a terrorist, a soldier, or just someone going to school. And so as we looked at all of these different cases from around the world, from different categories, we discovered a second thing. It doesn't just feel like a war zone. It's actually a new mode of conflict itself. If you think of cyber war as the hacking of networks, like war is its twin. It's the hacking of people on the networks by driving ideas viral through a mix of likes, shares, and lies. 
And just like in cybersecurity, you might see a diverse set of actors. So in cybersecurity, you might have everything from, uh, we've got people in this room who want to join Cyber Command in the US military, to uh, you might have bank robbers, to you might have teenage hacktivists, all of them with wildly different goals who end up using the very same tactics to breach a network. It's the same thing in like war. Like war is a space where, for example, um, ISIS's top recruiter is copycatting the pop star Taylor Swift. Or in turn, Lady Gaga fans are copycatting Russian military intelligence. And one, the goal is to sabotage US election, and the other is to sabotage a movie rollout. Doesn't make sense, sounds strange, but that's where it's at. It's also just like cybersecurity, where what happens on the network does not stay on the network. You can affect everything from battlefield outcomes to the outcomes of elections to public health. Uh, a lot of you um, are dealing, uh, if you're in school, we've got the return of childhood diseases that were, we thought were done when I was a kid, going back to the public health side. And yet anti-vaxxer conspiracy theories help bring them back. Or it might just be um, how we think about the truth itself. But what was also interesting about this is um, not just the impact of it, but as we looked at all of these different episodes and uses around the world, we kept seeing a consistent set of rules, just like in other realms of, you know, be it air warfare, uh, naval, there's, there's tactics and strategies, there's doctrines that went out, there's rules that are applied across the system. And it is important, I believe, for all of you to understand these rules and all the different roles that you play whether it is as current or future leaders, your roles as citizens, to just your roles as good family members. The organizations, the individuals that get these rules are the ones who are winning out now, and the ones that don't are the new losers of the game, not just online, but beyond. So what are those rules? Rule number one, as the X-Files told us, the truth is out there. In a world of mass collection and mass distribution, it's hard to keep things a secret. In fact, um, one CIA officer put it to us that all secrets now come with a half-life. And that gathering and sharing of information might happen uh, deliberately. So the average millennial will take over 26,000 selfies in their lifetime. And they will take it in the darndest of places. Uh, this is an Iraqi unit taking it in the middle of the Battle of Mosul. Uh, we've got an aviator in the room. Um, I know an Air Force guy that uh, did a, in the US military, it's called a combat selfie. And they did it actually overhead of the Battle of Mosul. It's not just those crazy kids. Um, we have the very first commander in chief to have used social media before he became commander in chief, not even Barack Obama. Donald Trump did not enter social media till he was 61 years old. And yet he brought into that role over 40,000 bits of data on everything from what he was doing, what he was saying, to what he was thinking. Not just overtly thinking, but you can also mine this for psychological data, um, influences, tells. Uh, this is one of the keys behind the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Now, that deliberate side can also be mirrored by the inadvertent um, background collection sharing. Uh, so anyone in the room wear exercise apps like Fitbits or something like that? Okay, we got, we, those are the healthy people. Um, so essentially what happened is they were looking at a um, map, a heat map of where in the world the users of these exercise apps were. And they noticed a little spike of light of customers in East Africa. And they went, that's interesting that we've got customers there. And then they zoomed down and they went, oh, it's really interesting that our little cu cluster of customers are not in a city, but they're in the middle of the desert of East Africa. And then they zoomed down and what you see here is solely off of the heat maps from the exercise apps, they discovered a classified US military facility and a CIA black site. What was happening is the guard force, a mix, a mix of special operations and private military contractors, were doing their morning jogs around the base of the perimeter and revealing not just its location, but it's pretty good targeting data. Uh, similarly, the, the location of an aircraft carrier was revealed this way, a near perfect outline of someone running, uh, doing their jog around it. Now, 
this sharing uh, can affect um, everything from tactical military uh, operations. Uh, compare the D-Day invasion, where the Allies were able to keep secret not just the location, but the day of it, with you know literally over a million moving uh, people and parts, versus the Bin Laden raid, supposed to be the most secretive military operation of our lifetime. Uh, the only people that were supposed to know about it at the time was the actual operators, who weren't formally told confirm the target until after the helicopter took off. The operation center and that famous picture from the White House of Obama and only his closest advisors in that very small room. That's it. Except there was a Pakistani cafe owner who was up late at night in Abbottabad, heard the helicopters come in and did the new natural thing. He went online and he complained. And his complaints about the noise of the first helicopter, the second helicopter, now there's an explosion, now there's a second explosion, were essentially a live feed of what was supposed to be the most top secret operation. And at the end of it, he said, oops, I guess I'm the guy who live tweeted the Bin Laden raid. Now, that took place in a country that had 6% internet connection at the time. Now, this is not just hitting um, military operations. It affects uh, political campaigns. Um, I'm from Virginia. At this point in the um, 2008 presidential campaign, the front runner for the Republican nomination was a fellow that a lot of you probably don't remember, was a senator from Virginia named George Allen. George Allen had locked up most of the conservative wing of the Republican Party's support. He was looking pretty good in polling in Iowa and New Hampshire. If you were a betting person, you would have said George Allen's going to be the one to get the nomination. Maybe he might win. Except George Allen goes to a rural state park in Virginia, and he is not ready for two technology changes. The collection of a digital camera and a new video sharing platform that had been created just a couple months earlier, inspired by Janet Jackson's episode at the Super Bowl, called YouTube. George Allen in this rural state park says a racist term that he should not have, and his what was known as the Makaka moment goes viral, and he never wins another election again. Now compare that, the un uh, uh, a candidate not ready for a camera, digital camera, and going viral, to how every single candidate running for president right now is hoping for that moment of virality. In fact, many of them are bringing the camera with them, whether it is into their home, to literally the dentist, to up on stage with them, because they want that magic moment of virality. Now, um, this leads to rule number two. The truth may be out there, but it can be buried underneath a sea of lies. And that is the essence of everything from Russian information warfare to uh, how it has hit domestic politics, to corporate crisis management, to teenage life. The critical case study in this, um, and you can think of this in everything from the proof case to for the historians in the room, it's a little bit like the Spanish Civil War before World War II, and that it was sort of the lesson that everyone else is looking at and learning from, was something that remains still controversial, the uh, 2016 election. Now, what happened at the start was a, you might think of it as a traditional cybersecurity event. You had a breach of an email network. I, I did interviews of um, everything from the White House cybersecurity coordinator at the time uh, to Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. And we asked them, you know, what were you thinking when you heard the news about this breach? And they actually said they weren't all that surprised and they weren't all that worried. Why? because it had happened every single previous election that we'd had email. And it had been bipartisan. Both Obama and McCain campaigns got hacked. Both Obama and Romney campaigns got hacked. So when they got hacked, they didn't think it was that big a deal. They'd been expecting it. What they weren't ready for, though, was not the theft of information, the like war spread of information. And entailed everything from the false front, um, Gustaver 2.0, which uh, was the presenting itself as the hacker, an individual Romanian. We now know it was Grucifer. It was Russian military intelligence, GRU, uh, to sites like Tennessee GOP there, 
It's a little bit small for you to see, but Tennessee GOP, their handle is, I love God, I love my country. Uh, They joined in 2015, uh, so just as the campaign is starting up. And um, 10 GOP, it turns out that they, the country they loved was not America or Tennessee, and they were instead a mid-20s Russian working at something known as the Internet Research Agency. Now, a couple of numbers are fascinating about 10 GOP there. And it was a company, that's a Twitter, it was a company by um, similar align efforts in Facebook, Instagram, and the like. Um, at its high point, 10 GOP had over 170,000 followers. Anyone in the room with 170,000 followers, please tweet out about the speech. Uh, but a couple things. That 170,000, that's 10 times the number of followers as the official real Republican Party. 10 times. But that's not the number that matters. Election Day 2016, 10 GOP there, the seventh most read account. Not the seventh most of the more than 3,000 documented Russian sock puppets. Sock puppet is when, like 10 GOP there, you have a person behind it who's presenting themselves as something else. Not the seventh most of the more than 60,000 Russian bot accounts. Bots are when you have an algorithm chirping away, driving overall web trends. The seventh most overall. More than pretty much every single media source, celebrity, politician, you name it. Why? Because 10 GOP was being echoed out by people with hundreds, or in the case of retired Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, hundreds of thousands of followers. Now, like any other military effort, there was not just one line. Uh, It was accompanied by, for example, the ad by, uh, I think, playing out on Facebook. A hundred, we now know that 146 million Americans, that's half the United States population, was unknowingly exposed to Russian propaganda via their Facebook accounts in the final months of the election. Now, this is not just about driving web trends, but social media, it's the opposite of Vegas. Uh, What happens there doesn't stay there. It hits other spaces. The particular vector is um, over 90% of professional journalists. So everything from whether you're a newspaper reporter to you're the producer of a local radio talk show, over 90% of them use social media to determine what story to cover, what angle to take on the story, who to interview for the story, and if it's performing well, to revisit it for another story, another episode. So it can be significant. But I don't want you to think about this as just politics or American. We see like war efforts going on on the top left there. Um, now, we were talking about this with um, some of the students at a visit before. Uh, that's the Instagram feed of a Mexican drug cartel. Uh, on the right is, um, just like in cybersecurity, you may see targeting of military networks. You may see targeting of corporations. This is from an episode where um, a Nike uh, 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 effort went after them to drive down their share price. That effort involved three um, lines uh, of activity. One was real Americans really upset at Nike, genuine actors. The second line of effort was uh, what are popularly known as alt-right trolls. It's basically people who are hyper-partisan and using all sorts of like fake accounts and um, misinformation to try and game the system. And then the third line of effort was our friends, the Russians, jumping in. And it's a great illustration of um, parts of the Russian strategy where they didn't create the controversy or the split. They just saw the fire to pour kerosene on top of. And what's notable about all of this is it's like any other tactic or technology. If it works and it has low barriers to entry, other people will copy it and you will get what we think of in military terms as proliferation. And the fun example of that um, comes from Lady Gaga. So uh, anyone in here a Lady Gaga fan? All right, anyone in here see the movie A Star is Born? Okay, so Lady Gaga fans are passionate. And in particular, they felt when her first movie, A Star is Born, came out, that she had the inherent right to have the number one movie in the box office. And how dare any other movie come out this same weekend? And so on the fan sites, they openly talked about We can do what the Russians did to the U.S. election to the rival movies coming out that same weekend, pushed out in particular one by Sony called Venom. 
So they did a copycatting of what the Russians did, everything from false front accounts to they created what you might think of as an astroturf movement. So astroturf is the parallel to a grassroots movement bottom up real people, but like AstroTurf, it's fake, but it feels real. Um, in this case, just like the Russians, they identified what they saw as the core vulnerabilities in the American me media ecosystem. Uh, they also figured out they should be people who were greater trusted. So the Lady Gaga movement, modeling after the Russia's uh, effort, posed as um, concerned moms who then particularly targeted local radio and TV as if there was a real protest movement about violence in movies, in particular this new movie Venom that's bad, don't let your kids see it, instead they ought to go see um, Lady Gaga's movie. I love this because it shows kind of the proliferation. Uh, for the military uh, ethicists in the room, one of the other things that the Lady Gaga fans had was a ethical discussion about weapons and tactics. And they concluded that it was ethical to copy Russian disinformation warfare, but in doing so, it was unethical to use real people's faces that they were posing as, so they would use stock photos. Um, now, this also shows the pattern where if you've been tracking the news, it's not just Lady Gaga fans who copycatted the Russians, but outed just about two weeks ago, the Chinese did. And they put together an almost uh, mirror network to what the Russians had done. Uh, just And again, it had a, a, a over a one year history of it. It was sort of revealed in the last couple of weeks. They deployed it. It, po it was posing as everything from uh, like 10 GOP conservative news sites to one of them was a, a fake woman from Colorado, built up credibility followers. Uh, and then as the Hong Kong protests, they pivoted from talking about pro-Trump, or the Colorado one was talking about how great hiking is, and pivoted to everything going on in Hong Kong as a CIA conspiracy. Uh, so we're seeing this proliferation uh, hitting lots of different sectors. This leads to rule number three. We are in a world where virality trumps veracity. It is more important that something go viral in terms of its power, and power defined as achieving your goals, that influence. It's more important that something go viral than it be true. It doesn't mean that the truth can't go viral. The truth can, but the power comes from the virality. And the power not just in shaping online behavior and belief, but the real world. Again, shaping everything from who someone votes for to whether they turn out to vote, to whether they join a protest movement, to whether they join an extremist group, to what movie people go to, to belief in uh, science, to the truth itself. I think a great illustration of this is the episode that happened a couple, uh, about a half year back when a group of high school students from Covington, Kentucky visited Washington, DC. Now, go back to rule number one. We have more data about this episode than the CIA could have dreamed of a decade ago. We have video of what those kids were doing from three hours before to they got into an argument with a Native American. We have video from three different angles. We've got all the data. But my guess is if we did a survey of this room, 60% of you would say one thing happened, 40% of you would say something else happened, and you would cling to it like it's the tr most important truth itself because you've been shaped by whichever echo chamber that virality steered. And notice again, I didn't say what happened. It's just rather how we've been shaped by all of this. Now, if this is the case that virality is so crucial, we need to understand why things go viral. And whether uh, it was um, Russian information warfare, political ads, conspiracy theories like Pizzagate, to jokes like Pizza Rat, if you remember that. There were consistent attributes of virality. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but one I think is illustrative of this is the notion of shared, uh, sorry, of planned authenticity. Now, planned authenticity, that sounds like a contradiction. How do you plan to be authentic? But uh, the, uh, arguably the, the Marie von Clausewitz of this tactic is Taylor Swift. Um, now, she, at a young teenage, like Marie, wrote an essay about her strategy. 
um, uh, and the strategy was to use this mechanism to achieve popularity and power within the music game, and she's become the richest self-made woman under the age of 40. And she calls it Taylorking, and Taylorking embraces those two technology revolutions that I talked about. She gathers information on scale in real time like never before in terms of overall trends, but simultaneously individual behavior. So she is able to know whether someone breaks up with their boyfriend, whether they pass a driver's license, what shirt they chose to wear that day. And then using that information, she will engage. She will congratulate them on passing the driver's license, console them on breaking up with their boyfriend. I love your shirt. She is acting like she is their friend. And the new meaning of the term, she is their friend. But she's doing it conscious of the fact that the whole world is watching. It's the exact same tactic that that's the handle of Junaid Hussein, who uh, was ISIS's uh, top recruiter. Um, and in his case, he wasn't trying to uh, persuade people to buy an album. He ended up persuading over 30,000 people from 99 plus countries to travel to Iraq and Syria to join a group made up of people they'd never met before. It was the exact opposite of how Al-Qaeda built out. Al-Qaeda, the term itself translates as the base. It was a reference to the mountain camp in Afghanistan that you had to be known and trusted to get to. ISIS, the flip. And again, not just convincing people to join, but also inspiring acts of terrorism everywhere from Texas to Paris. Now, this leads to our next rule. We are seeing a reordering of the art of the possible in pretty much every single realm. We are seeing winners that wouldn't have been able to win before, and people that we thought or organizations that were dominant uh, become the new losers. It's happening in politics. Donald Trump himself says, I would not have won without social media. Now, it's a little bit more of a complex story. It was really the um, campaign side as opposed to what most people point to as his Twitter feed. But maybe you don't believe Donald Trump. We interviewed instead uh, the top political campaign strategist uh, in Washington, D.C., someone who makes um, literally millions of dollars advising campaigns. Uh, and he walked us through all the metrics that they use to determine whether a candidate is uh, likely to win. Uh, everything from you know, how much campaign cash you have, how many offices you open up in each county, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, Donald Trump should not have won. And he was not making a, a moral ethical. Remember, he's a political campaign strategist. He was just saying, by our metrics, he should not have beaten not just Hillary, but his 19 other rivals for the Republican nomination. But he ended it by saying, of course, he did win. And it's because all of these old rules and metrics that we used aren't the way to win anymore. It's the same phenomenon as I mentioned um, in the terrorism game. ISIS rises uh, in part by inverting how you operate, but it also changed the way of battlefield operations. Instead of trying to keep its invasion of Iraq secret, like we would, did with the D-Day or um, the Bin Laden raid, they created a hashtag, and the hashtag was literally all eyes on ISIS, because they wanted everyone watching, everyone from the Iraqi soldiers on the opposite side of the battlefield. It's part of the story of how an invasion force of 2,500 defeats a defending force of over 20,000 because of the fear pandemic spread online, but also they wanted us watching. And a United States that had just weeks earlier said, we're never, we're not going back into Iraq for another generation. ISIS goes viral and polling shows that Americans become more afraid of terrorism after this than in the weeks after 9-11. ISIS had not achieved a major attack that had killed thousands of Americans, but we were more afraid of terrorism. And then that leads us to redeploy again into Iraq and the like. Entertainment, celebrities. Uh, if you're under the age of 30, you recognize these as some of the most influential people. If you're over the age of 30, you have no idea who they are. Uh, to business, I love this case. Um, Burger King is considered one of the best corporate brands at all of this. Um, they're taught in business schools as, as a model. And what you see here is Burger King engaged in an online beef with Kanye West and McDonald's as a way of selling beef. Everything I just said would have made no sense 15 years ago, and yet it is a best practice. 
But it's not just about the new winners and losers. It's also about the new responsibilities of kind of the ultimate winners and kind of losers, the powers not just on the battlefield, but those that control the battlefield itself. Go back to the story of young Mark Zuckerberg. 15 years ago, he's a teenager writing software. Software of Facebook is originally about rating how hot your dorm room mates are. And it moves on to become a platform used around the world. He becomes incredibly wealthy, but he also becomes one of the most powerful people, not just in business, but war and politics itself. Because with the simple change of his mind, he can tilt the playing field one way or another whether it's an effort over disinformation campaigns targeting election, hate and extremist groups, public health, anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory, or um, as we saw the episode, uh, even mass killings, uh, where this from Myanmar, where ultimately 700,000 people were targeted through a campaign that was coordinated um, and motivated via social media platforms. And what you can see, and I love this picture of Zuckerberg in front of Congress, because it shows everyone's uneasiness at this and trying to figure out just what to do about it. Is it the responsibility of the company or is it the responsibility of the law? And we've kind of not yet answered that. And this is a political issue that's going to be with us for at least the next generation. But guess what? It's just like warfare. There's a back and forth. There's continual refinement. And so you ain't seen nothing yet. Two core challenges. The first, only half the world is online. Half the world is still to come. Think how much of a challenge we've had at all of this with our over two centuries of experience at democracy, free media, etc. Half the world won't have that. So it's going to be an interesting thing to play out. And particularly for those of you going into the military, a lot of this will be in the spaces that you might deploy into. But the second is the tactics, the technology continues to advance. And so um, this is uh, particularly the case with artificial intelligence, popularly known as deep fakes. This comes in two types. One is where you use AI to take something that's real and manipulate it into something that's fake. Uh, the top, it's a still shot. You can see it online. It's a video of a speech that Barack Obama never gave. The second type is where you use, you create something out of nothing. It's completely fake, but it looks real. So this is what happened when they asked a AI to generate what human beings think celebrities should look like. Uh, you can see we're obsessed with the Hemsworth family. And um, now what I think is notable about this, this is a pretty dated picture. You can see um, little tells that he's fake if you look close. Um, he's the ugly Hemsworth. He's got his ears slightly off, his eyes are off. The next version of it, you basically say, hey, I fixed that. Or in her case, as an example, have the hair uh, covered and the like. Like everything, it'll be used for entertainment. In fact, it already is. There's a new Will Smith movie coming out where Will Smith stars opposite a deep fake of Will Smith. Um, it's called Gemini Man. But it'll also be weaponized. And we already see examples of it uh, targeting individuals, putting them into videos that they were never in. To um, This is a political version. It's not a deep fake, but it gives you a sense of where we're going. Uh, this young woman was one of the gun control activists after the Parkland shooting in Florida. She did a shoot on the left. That's the reality where she tore up a um, uh, bullseye from a shooting range. The imagery was manipulated to make it look not just she looks eviler, but also to make it look like she was tearing up the Constitution. That falsehood was then sent viral by, go back to the example of Nike being targeted, the same kind of three lines of effort. One, um, gun rights activists. Two, alt-right trolls, hyper-partisan. Three, our friends, the Russians. The result of it was more people saw the truth of her tearing up the Constitution than the actual reality of what she did or the debunking of it. So in closing, We've got a lot of challenges. And it's much like, say, 15 years back, where we started to realize about cybersecurity and cyber war, we had a lot of challenges in the threats to networks. And apt to that parallel, and also to how I was introduced, the field of public health, um, I think there's lessons to be learned from these other areas. The primary one is there's no silver bullet solution to this. There, as long as we have people, as long as we have the internet, we will see this kind of interactivity. So instead, it's about risk managing it. 
And there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that we have to do. You break it down by government action, corporate action, individual action. Just like in um, public health, no one would say, oh, well, um, we have a Center for Diseases Control. I guess I don't need to wash my hands. Or similarly, um, no one would say in cybersecurity, well, we, um, I have good two-factor on my Gmail. That's why we don't need uh, a um, US military cyber unit, right? We need layers of action. So real rapidly, the sort of things that we need to undertake um, on the governmental side, we need something that um, many of you are taught. We need a strategy. The Trump administration at the, um, several months back released the very first update to US cybersecurity strategy in 15 years. It's a good advance. Neither Bush nor Obama administration had updated the strategy. There's only one problem. It had not a single sentence about this entire problem set. And that's in the wake of all the things that have played out over the last couple of years. So without a strategy, what we have instead is a lot of ad hoc action. There's some cool things being done, say at NSA, uh, but then there's other areas where we're not seeing action. Uh, a particular issue is um, we really need whole of government on this. Uh, so for example, since our election, over 30 other nations have seen their elections targeted similarly. State Department hasn't been bringing together all the democracies to work together on this. Or we were talking about this earlier, uh, the education side, um, digital literacy is something that we don't have taught here. Um, or it might be legal action that's needed to get ahead of problems like deep fakes. Um, corporate side. Corporate, the companies that run these networks have to understand that they have a new kind of responsibility. They are no longer running just communication spaces or marketplaces. They are running political and battle spaces. And that brings a very different way of looking at the world that's required. And we've seen them coming to grips with this over the last couple of years and literally days. Um, and similarly, if instead, if you're not a platform company, but you're a regular company, you've got to think about this as another threat factor against you. And then finally, in closing, there's our role, like in cybersecurity, like in public health. It depends on knowledge and ethics. So the most vulnerable, like in public health, like in cybersecurity, are the ignorant. I don't mean that in kind of the insulting way. I just mean people who don't understand, don't know what's going on. Over 60% of social media users Cannot, they, they not only can't tell the difference between real and fake news, they can't tell the difference between an ad and a news item. Over 60% of social media users don't know how the companies that they use make money, so they don't realize I'm literally the product. Um, but it's also about this sense of ethic. Um, I teach my kids, and they are taught in their schools, Cover your mouth when you cough. That does nothing to defend you. It's all about you taking responsibility for everyone else that you connect with. Now think about the digital version of this. We all have that friend, that coworker, that relative, who does the digital version of coughing in your face. They spread conspiracy theory, something a little bit extremist, fake or junk news. Maybe it's us. And think about how we react to that as opposed to if they walked up and coughed in our face. Until we develop that ethic to guide our own personal behavior, but also push back to protect this ecosystem, we will continue to be the targets and losers of like war rather than building the kind of resilience as a nation, as organizations, as individuals that we need to thrive in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So we have some time for questions, and if uh, you'd like to ask a question, we have two mics set up, so please come on down, and uh, we can continue the conversation via your questions. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Peter. Thank you.
Um, good evening. Um, my name is Kelly Evans. I'm a junior in the Corps of Cadets. Um, I was curious, so we had the Todd lecture earlier today, and um, I don't remember who, but one of the three of you mentioned that in different countries, they, um, in like elementary, middle school, high school, they educate the kids about internet use, what to look for. Um, and I feel like our generation is a little bit better about using social media and stuff like that because we're, we've grown up around it and we know it. Do you think that it would be possible for the government to pair with some of the bigger um, social media sites to try and educate the users that are older and barely know how to turn on their computers? Yeah. So, great question and, and a number of different things that come out of that. Um, the first is uh, the issue of, um, you hit it exactly, no, this is not a young person only problem. Uh, actually, the data shows that um, baby boomers are seven times more likely to share false information online than any other generation. Um, essentially, what they said video games would do to youth, Facebook did to them. Um, the, but you are not, there's, there's two issues here. One, we could say, oh, well, given that, we'll just wait till you all become four-star generals and CEOs and presidents. Well, the challenge is that still gives us a couple decades in between of bad stuff, right? Um, but the other part of it is you are not safe from it either. Um, and one of the interesting things is they, they did, for example, studies that showed um, they compared uh, everything from um, PhD students to youth, uh, et cetera, and they found that um, age was an inoculator against this. Um, conventional education, if you had a PhD, you were still just as likely. It was rather about having digital literacy, which is a particular kind of literacy, uh, which is, um, it's not fact checking, direct fact checking does not work. All the data shows that, even though we keep defaulting to that as a response. Um, instead, it's understanding uh, whether it's these rules that I laid out to understanding that imagery can be manipulated and giving people the chance to work with manipulating imagery so then they see that so then they go there to understanding um, the tactics that go after particular parts of your psychology and so you have that kind of awareness of it um, so there's a particular kind of sort of training set and um, as was said earlier today, there's some nations that have these, and if, if that's important because we often, um, you know, this feels kind of scary, and then often sometimes goes to, you know, but in the United States we have the First Amendment. Well, there's nations like the Estonians, like the Finlands, that have vibrant democracies and yet have built up resilience against these kind of threats. The final thing that they have is something that we really need to go after, and I hope this is sort of part of the conversation here, is I, I spoke with the Estonian ambassador about this, and he said one of the keys is not just the training set, it's that we talk about it all the time. There's no um, sort of fear of talking about it, no denial around it. And again, think of the echo in public health. Some of the worst diseases that, that spread are the ones that people are afraid to talk about. And it's the same phenomena here. And unfortunately, we've not had that kind of open discussion about it. So half the people in this room uh, who were Facebook users, and some of the people, youth will go, I'm Facebook, that's my grandparents. If you're on Instagram, Facebook owns it, sorry to tell, break the news to you. Um, <laughs> over half the people were exposed to it. How many of you have come to grips with that? Or in turn, major figures in politics and media, how many, statistically they have too, and not statistically, we can point to episodes, how many of them have said, hey, I got taken in in 2016. This is what I'm doing so that it doesn't happen again, as opposed to just not talking about it. Um, but it also is not just on kind of the body politic. Uh, it goes back to, as you brought it up, the role of the companies themselves. Part of why most of you don't know this is, um, for example, uh, you know, originally Facebook was in denial that it happened. Uh, November 2016, Zuckerberg says it's a quote, pretty crazy idea uh, that this happened. Then they have to revise that and say, actually, yeah, it was 140. Um, but then they further, uh, when the data is put out, it's not pushed to you, the user. It's actually placed solely on the desktop version of Facebook where of course, you know, most people's interaction is this, you can't get it with this. 
and it's put where you actively have to go hunt it out to find out if you were exposed or not. Think about a completely opposite realm, which we've learned about in cybersecurity, where if you're an Instagram or Facebook user, or Gmail or whatnot, what they now push out to you things like, hey, I know you have a password, but it needs to be a strong password. Or, hey, you should also have two-factor. You should have the cell phone number or something else on it. They're proactive in equipping you. They're not proactive in equipping you to defend yourself. You imagine pop-ups that say, hey, here's how people are sometimes taken in by conspiracy theory. Here's what you can do to defend yourself. So again, you know, there's layers to this from whether it's the education system to uh, corporate that we could go after this in a way that very much preserves our rights. Great question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for coming to the University. The speech was really informative to uh, an environmental science student. So uh, I'm Jack Carlson. What I wanted to ask was that you mentioned that we see all this type of uh, technological influence from major parties like uh, Russia, China, and certainly other countries like England, Germany, or big countries in the NATO alliance. What I wanted to ask is that do we see this type of uh, investment put in by other countries like, say, Pakistan or even some of the African nations? And if so, how long would it take for them to catch up? Because you mentioned only about half the world's population is online. Do we see the same investment being put in by other countries, or is it really only confined to the major players? Yeah, uh, great question. But before I jump into the direct answer, even the, the field that you're interested in has been shaped by this. Um, so, for example, there was the recent UN meeting, um, and climate change was a big issue there. And there was a, uh, a an online campaign uh, that you know was using all these very same tactics to um, pu push climate change denialism, uh, attacking certain figures who are climate scientists and the like. Uh, so it was used in a negative way. The flip side is, and, and I've worked with uh, people in the field, is. Um, you can use these very same tools of virality for good. They're, they're, they're just like any other tool, you know, a fork or whatever. It can be used for good or bad. So, um, you know, we talked about negative episodes of virality. If you're a Taylor Swift fan, you'd say, well, all of this is positive. But a different example would be Ice Bucket Challenge. Uh, that was a deliberate campaign that focused on using this virality to bring attention to um, the cause. Uh, climate change, um, uh, too much of the discussion has uh, fallen into sort of trying to be a fact-based discussion where one side is pushing out scientific reports and in not just technical terms but saying this is the facts of the matter when we know in terms of virality it's not just the pure facts, it's for example, you know, those networks of narrative around it. So, you know, far more important than the um, report was, for instance, the image of that single polar bear floating on the ice going away, or the story of the 16-year-old little girl from uh, Sweden who, I mean, so the, even in the debate around environmental science, we're going to have to utilize, it's already being utilized, uh, it needs to be utilized better. Um, so uh, your question though is about, hey, are there other players out there? And absolutely, this is a space that has very low barriers to entry, so it's uh, pretty much everyone. Um, small states, um, uh, you mentioned uh, India, Pakistan, um, this has uh, shaped everything from um, Indian elections, to um, actually uh, certain episodes of mass killing within India, um, to the dust up between India and Pakistan, uh, had all these really strange attributes of like war happening, um, where uh, you had uh, false news reports planted, uh, et cetera, in their contention. Um, you also have part of the aid of this is a brewing, um, I did a previous book on private military contractors, kind of the corporate versions of mercenaries. We're seeing the like war side of it. Four higher companies that will run these campaigns for you. Um, so a different uh, small nation version. Uh, democracy activists in the Middle East were being targeted by, it was funded by a government, but the one running the operation was a four higher company 
oh, by the way, don't just think that hits the outside the world. We saw a similar episode um, hit at a local election level in California. A, um, essentially, uh, in a county election, um, the county board makeup was going to affect a multi-million dollar um, hospital deal. And so the uh, local millionaire, the real estate guy, uh, hired a private military, sorry, a private uh, influence operation company to try and shape the outcome of the county election. And, you know, he spent a quarter million dollars in the hope of getting the seven million dollars. So we're going to see this hit layers. Um, and that, again, is why I go back to that notion of um, you're not going to be able to deter this kind of action. There's just too much of it going on at too many layers. It's more about building resilience against it. And the great thing about resilience is that it aids in whatever the attack is. If I'm being attacked by someone who is trying to sell me bad product or push disinformation from a political, the resilience works against both of them. And so it's, it's a better way of uh, defending ourselves. Great question. Good evening, sir, and thank you for the awesome lecture. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask about like war in reference to developing nations. I understand that in developing nations, communication infrastructure isn't a huge thing right now. Um, so I wanted to know what a like war would kind of do to the development in a developing nation, its politics, um, conflict in the region, and if it doesn't, then what can we kind of do, what can international communities try and do to kind of prepare for when they take on the internet? Yeah, a great question because one of the things while there has not been the um, the build out of infrastructure following the same pattern in the United States, what you are seeing in much of the developing world is two phenomena. One is sort of skipping a generation and jumping right into cell phone, smartphone. So wherever you are in the world actually there is mass use of cell phone and it goes back to that kind of the ability to network, to gather information, to share it. Um, you know, and, and this affects whether it's local politics or that episode of um, mass killings I mentioned in India to you're deploying as a soldier somewhere in the Middle East, someone with a cell phone is going to be there to uh, out you. I had to, uh, uh, a while back break the news to Special Operations Command that one of their supposedly secret operations in the Middle East was being talked about on Facebook. Um, so you've got that kind of thing going on, but your question is particularly about the politics of it. And it actually links back to the prior question. Um, the, the case studies that show both the impact of what you're asking about, um, but also are like little battle labs for the 2020 US election is the Philippines and Brazil, um, where we saw um, sort of an advancement of some of the tactics that were used in 20, just like any other war, you know, kind of what works first and then the other side builds a, a little bit of a counter. Um, the attacker moves to something else. And so we've seen certain usages in those um, elections. Also some of the smaller East European elections more recently in the EU, they've, they're, we're seeing slightly modulated tactics, similarities, but kind of moving into new realms. Um, and so this is where I go back to kind of thinking about the transnational nature of it. The United States ought to be not just aiding these other nations in building resilience, but learning from both what hit them and in the success cases of defending themselves, what happened. Um, and ideally, we ought to be saying, you hit this other democracy, it's as if you hit us, in the hope that they're doing the same. We're actually um, a great illustration of this, um, not a small country, uh, but we're you know, not too far from the Canadian border. There is a fascinating comparison between Canada has an upcoming election and has a clear and fairly cohesive national strategy to defend it that's bringing together everything from their intelligence community and government to their media. Uh, they're training their campaign beat reporters, not what to report. They're a democracy, don't, they don't tell them that. But they are equipping them by saying, here's what we've seen political journalists be targeted with in other elections. You should know about it. Move forward, be equipped. 
So they've got this kind of comprehensive strategy, everything from their intelligence community to engagement with media across the border in the United States. We don't have that kind of comprehensive strategy. Good evening, Dr. Singer. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, do you see the United States using like war in the future to combat terrorism and other future threats and conflicts? So, uh, yes, and not just in the future. We've already done it. Um, so the, uh, the, the book that this is coming out of, the opening scene is um, the... Uh, one of the opening scenes is the ISIS uh, takeover of northern Iraq and ISIS kind of using all of these tactics and everyone on the opposing side, Iraqi army, but also US military, kind of thrown back and not knowing how to handle it. Um, but there's a long, and there's a lot of military historians in the room, there is a, a long history of the United States not doing well in kind of the first battle, but then rapidly learning and implementing. And the close of the book is um, uh, looking at some of the things that US military has put into place since um, and they range from ones that uh, are vanilla and nice, and uh, so the, the closing scene of the book is um, a visit to Fort Polk, which is a, a military base, which has a long history of being where the U.S. military experiments. It's where we did um, the Louisiana maneuvers back in the 1940 period that figured out how to use trucks and tanks instead of horses, and they've changed that training ground to incorporate training for some of these techniques. Um, so that's the overt side. There's also, go back to rule number one. No secret, you know, the truth is out there. Um, one of the things that CENTCOM did uh, is um, had a contract that was put out and said, um, hey, we'd like to buy software that would allow one person to control at a minimum 10 social media accounts. Hmm, sounds a little bit parallel to what the Russians were doing. We actually did a lot of these sort of similar things targeting ISIS, um, getting, helping to drive down what they were attempting to push viral and push alternative messaging. Go back to the discourse of um, Zuckerberg. No one raised free speech issues around that everyone universally we agree ISIS is bad. What's become the challenge and is continuing to be an issue and will in our, our body politic is what happens as there are more contested political identities and you see the use of these tactics either taking people offline or um, uh, pushing alternative uh, uh, influences on them um, where maybe we don't all agree they're bad. And the point where this has really kind of exploded over is far-right extremism. Um, we've had more Americans actually killed by far-right extremists than ISIS itself, but it's a contested political ideology inside the United States. So what you're seeing is both our body politic, but the companies themselves trying to come to grips with everything from no one had an issue of uh, intelligence community and FBI infiltrating um, ISIS networks and false front accounts to no one had a, a challenge of ISIS um, knock offline their accounts, make Janae Hussein's job harder. Uh, there was an, uh, if you put an ISIS black flag up, it would, the algorithm would immediately knock you offline. Um, but when it moved into uh, post Charlottesville, then post Poway, Pittsburgh killing, we started to see contestation around that. And one of the interesting things is it's part of kind of people's um, anger at the companies themselves is either you didn't do enough uh, or I don't like that you did too much, right? So um, as an example, uh, neo-Nazi imagery, it was okay to post it on Facebook and the like after Pittsburgh, after the Poway, but, and they said, you know, freedom of speech issues and the like, and it's not our role to adjudicate. After the Christchurch mass killing, then they changed their mind and then said, okay, now we're no longer doing it. 
And so you had people mad at them before for not doing enough, and then you had other people saying, now freedom of speech are biased against me. So this kind of contestation is going to be one of these, these political issues. But what again, what's happening is we're mainly deferring to the companies themselves to decide it for us what are essentially political questions. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Uh, I remember this summer when Dr. Morris and I were in Sylvania and the rest of the Balkans. Um, we learned it out, and through our analysis, that Sylvania as a country doesn't really fear issues like this and other general cyber and information warfare issues in general. Um, what can we say to a country like Sylvania that just isn't worried about this issue at all? Could these rules help them? Uh, I think I would, we would point to them, uh, look at what has hit some of both larger, more powerful states than you and how tough a time they've had it to look in your neighborhood and what has happened to nearby neighbors. So uh, we've seen these campaigns um, warp uh, democracy, um, enhance Russian influence, spread misinformation uh, in Hungary, in um, uh, Macedonia and the like. So it's, again, it's the kind of thing that uh, we had, you know, what, happened to the U.S. 2016 election had already happened in Ukraine in 2014. It hit Poland in 2015. We just sort of had this, um, well, it could happen to us, right? Uh, the second part of it, it of the challenge is, um, and this again goes to some of the things that you all as students uh, wrestle with all the time, is there's no one single field that owns this topic. It's a topic, notice what we've talked about, everything from national security to education policy to the role of um, business networks. And so one of the other challenges, and I think um, that we've had with this, is you see, and this is actually what motivated us in part to do the book, is that the people that, un that understood what Russia was doing in Ukraine were completely disconnected from the campaign beat reporter. So the people were like, no, this is, a, a, this is completely, this is the game plan. It's out in the open. It's known. They've been doing this for years. And then another set of people are utterly surprised by it. Or in turn, the people that um, uh, do counterterrorism or are interested in Middle East issues are fundamentally different than someone who's um, wrestling with uh, social media uh, gang uh, issues in, in, in um, Chicago. And yet we're seeing, or vice versa, and we're seeing insights that could be pulled from these different fields, but too often as, you know, kind of um, both government policy, but also academia research, we try and break it down into these fields and we have these silos, and so we don't get um, shared insights and information. And that would be the other thing for the, you know, your, your colleagues potentially in Slovenia would be, you know, you gotta think of this as, there's a, there's a certain military aspect of it. There's a certain you know, election aspect of it. There's also a, you know, your education people need to be involved in this discussion. And that, that's an that's a absence that we have in our space too. Hi, good evening, sir. Uh, so to my understanding, uh, in information warfare and in uh, psyops, We've conventionally used pamphlets, we've used posters, we've broadcast information. Uh, but my question for you is, would you recommend um, in information operations incorporating a like war as an information related capability to use on the battlefield? And uh, would it be ethical? And if not, what would those concerns be? We're, we're already doing it. We and okay. um, we put your finger on one of the challenges is that in some ways we were behind the, the curve. Um, you know, we're pushing out pamphlets when other people are, um, you know, running uh, YouTube videos, getting hundreds of thousands of hits. Um, but it, it's not just about the, the platform that you're on. Um, you can be on these platforms and utterly fail because you have a process that's wrong. It's not an understanding and embracing uh, what's happening. One of the other aspects of virality is that it understands that um, every single message that, that's pushed out, every single sort of weapons use is also like a, an experiment. And so um, the, uh, 
the operations that win, whether it's a political campaign to literally the BuzzFeed company uh, to um, ISIS operations, uh, don't send out one message, they actually flood the zone. And, but it's not just the amount, it's the um, process of it. So there's a great comparison. Um, you mentioned PSYOPs and like, we're talking the world of Special Operations Command. Um, so Special Operations Command, uh, again, go back to the question about learning. At the early stage of this, they had a process where um, essentially a round, don't, don't hold me to this number, I'm literally on stage saying, don't hold me to this number, um, but let's say roughly 10 mid-career so major lieutenant colonel level, white male, most of them non-Arabic speaking, would debate for multiple days using PowerPoint, what's the perfect counter ISIS message? Which is of course targeting some 18 year old from the region. In that same time period, ISIS as an, as an entity is pushing out, it had 50 different official ISIS media channels online. It had roughly, again, loose numbers, 10,000 fighters with their own messages that they're pushing out to another, depending on how you cut it, 20,000 fanboys who are not official members. They're not in the battlefield, but they're somewhere else chirping out the message. This mass amount of messages on lots of different things and then one of them would hit, and then the whole network would pivot on top of it. For those of you that are interested in electoral politics, that process and misunderstanding is a near mirror of Hillary Clinton's campaign, which had, I believe the number was 11 people in charge of her Twitter feed. And so 11 people will debate back and forth about what the one message would be and you get lowest common denominator and the outcome. Go back to that notion of um, authenticity. Hillary Clinton is a real person. She did not come across as real online. Burger King, I hate to tell you, there's not an actual Burger King. <laughs> Burger King comes across as real online, right? And so it's, it's not just about being in these spaces, it's about how you operate in them and whether, again, you're embracing these rules or not. So this will be the last question. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Dr. Singer. Thank you for the amazing speech and the valuable insights it provided. Thank you. My question for you is, what do you think the best approach is for reducing the spread of misinformation while also preventing the induction of bias into social media? Great, great um, question to end on. Um, so one of the issues that's playing out in this sort of discourse over bias is, um, if you're a sports fan, it's called working the referees. Um, so. The funny way of kind of dealing with toxicity online is then to, and, and this conspiracy theory like, is to say literally the game itself is rigged against me. Um, and we, you will see this happen, you, you know, most often it goes back to that notion of ignorance. You, um, politicians particularly do this, of both stripes, where they'll say, hey, my Twitter feed suggested to a Democrat will say, my Twitter feed suggested to me that I ought to follow Donald Trump, Ivanka Trump, and Fox News. This shows it's biased against me. Or in turn, uh, a Republican figure, a senator did this saying, you know, it suggested that I ought to follow, you know, Huffington Post and Elizabeth Warren. It shows they're biased against me. No, it shows that you're ignorant. It shows that you don't know how the algorithms on the side that are not, it's a natural algorithm that's designed, its whole purpose is to create engagement. Why is it steering Donald Trump to your feed? Not because it thinks you love Donald Trump or wants to persuade you to love Donald Trump. It thinks you will react to it. You will click more, you will share more, you will argue with him. And we are a company that makes money off of the engagement or in turn, it's steering you to this other side. So much of the discourse around the bias problem is actually drawn out of this combination of one, working the referees, trying to shape the environment 
so that you get, get greater kind of control over potentially during the legislative process and like. And the second, it's drawing upon ignorance. So it is um, pushed and those arguments work, but if we are ourselves more ready users, it'd be a little bit the equivalent of, you'll recall, um, at one point in, on the internet, you know, you had a senator who said, well, it's like a, you know, the internet, it's like a bunch of tubes. And, you know, everyone, like, no. And the fact that you think it's like that means maybe you ought not to be the one deciding its future. Um, and it's the same phenomenon. A lot of you probably saw those first hearings with Mark Zuckerberg and many of the questions that were asked to him, some of them were on the bias question. Uh, most of the legislative interaction with him was embarrassing. Now, um, my hope is we get that combination of one, um, the individuals themselves go, I can't let this happen. I gotta get smarter about this. And you're seeing that happen in more recent hearings. And two, that's on us to be the ones that pressure back and say, no, you know, this is what I want you to push. I am a voter, you are, or I'm, I'm a user of your company. This kind of explanation doesn't work anymore. I actually understand the rules of the game, and this is what I would like you to see to better represent my interests, be it either as a citizen or better represent my interests as a user, a customer of your company. So I think, again, none of this, notice at no point did I say, you know, censor people, support one side or the government intervention in terms of censoring, you can still maintain freedom of speech and yet have a internet ecosystem that doesn't reward the forces of toxicity and the toxicity forces are you know, disinformation, for foreign influence campaigns, conspiracy theory, hate and extremism, it is not necessary that they find a hospitable environment. We can create an environment that makes it harder for them to operate and um, easier for us to defend ourselves. But it all goes back to that notion of layers of government action, corporate, and our own individual knowledge and sense of responsibility. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity. Great question, and also just to talk to all of you about it. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for your contributions over the past uh, 48 hours, and also Benedetta, um, Ian, David, and Paul. Your thoughts have been very impactful for us and have been significant and will help us develop leaders and respond to some of the things that you address. So thank you very much. Have a great evening, everybody.